Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. If you are interested in storage in OpenStack, then you're in the right place because we're talking about Cinder and Swift and how they work together. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is uh, John Dickinson, and I work, I'm the PTL for Swift. I work for a company called SwiftStack, and I, uh, I, when we were putting this together, preparing for the summit, uh, John and I were talking about, or just realizing, there's a lot of confusion in um, about how the storage projects inside of OpenStack work together. So we really wanted to uh, clarify a lot of that. Yeah. So uh, my name is John Griffith, um, the other John. So I work at Solid Fire, and I'm currently the PTL for the Cinder project, and that's the block storage side. So as John said, we wanted to get together and talk about uh, how the two different storage platforms work together. And then also, there's a lot of confusion amongst a lot of people about what the differences are. So we're going to talk about that as well. So the reality is we need something new, and we all kind of know this, which is why we're here and looking for some sort of storage system. Applications have really changed recently, and I mean like recently in the past 10, 15 years or so. And we need to move beyond something that is just silos of data storage, and we need to be able to have the flexibility and the scale that's demanded by what applications are using today. So if you need to go beyond the capabil capabilities of a single hard drive and you want to get beyond the pain points caused by large ra RAID volumes, then the reality is you need something new. And we know that there are people uh, writing new kinds of applications all over the world, building massive websites that are at a larger scale than they've ever done before. We've got the proliferation of all these devices, mobile devices, laptops, all of this kind of stuff. And we also need to make sure that our infrastructure changes to meet that. And I think the fundamental promise of the cloud, one of them, is that you have the power to tailor your infrastructure exactly to your use case. We've seen this happen a lot with the compute side of the house, and I think we're also seeing that happen with the storage side of the house. And the, the, the basic idea here is you need something to abstract away your data apart from the media upon which it is actually stored. And that's the fundamental thing that I think that both Cinder and Swift bring. We have a system that is able to break that, that connection, which means that even if a particular piece of hardware fails, your data is still there. You're not intrinsically tied to what's going on. You know, you can think about in the past, uh, people have always kind of assumed, you know, if you can drop it on your toe, it's a thing. And, you know, if, if you've got these ideas, you put it on something that you can drop on your toe, like, stone tablets or books or something like this. And you know, think back a thousand years. Somebody wanted to kill an idea, what did they do? Well, they rode into town and they burned all the books. You destroy the media and then you have destroyed the data, the information, right? Well, what's really interesting now is that we're faced with uh, rapid pro a rapid proliferation of different types of media that they come and go, new protocols, you need to be able to um, swap those out and grow over time. So what we need is something fundamentally different than what traditional storage has been able to give us. And that's why we have uh, systems like Cinder and Swift. And, the, and with that growth, the reality is that you have to solve this on distributed systems. Why? Because one storage system is not big enough to handle all of your storage needs. You're going to run out of space if you put it on one hard drive or if you try to uh, just keep it even in just one server. So you need something that goes bigger. So how do you do that? You have to put it on more than one system. Therefore, you need something that's distributed. And in the distributed systems, there's a, uh, there's a principle. It's called the CAP theorem. It stands for uh, consistency and availability and partition tolerance. And what the CAP theorem says is that you can choose two of these. So let's go over them very briefly. Partition tolerance basically means that you can withstand like a timeout or a network failure uh, in your system. So when the two, uh, two pieces of your uh, distributed system are trying to talk to one another, they still work when they can't talk to one another. The consistency is what happens if uh, it, making sure that both of your systems or all of the pieces of your, of your distributed system um, have the same view of the world. And availability means uh, that it's always going to respond to requests when it gets them. So you can choose two things. You have to choose partition tolerance. So this puts you into two buckets. You can either have something that is eventually consistent, and this is something that means that uh, even when you have a hardware failure, the system is still going to be able to respond to your system. 
This is what we see a lot with object storage. And I gave a couple of um, other talks already this week about uh, Swift and how that's put together. And we'll cover it a little bit here as well. And then the other piece is you have a, an enforced, a strong consistency system. And this is what we're really used to as far as putting in boot devices for your servers or uh, building uh, databases and things like this. You need to make sure that you have uh, strong, consistent storage, generally used with like block storage, to um, to build out things that are, uh, you know, you can't change underneath what's happening underneath them. Um, so what you sacrifice in that sense is when half of your distributed system is unavailable, well, then the whole system is unavailable sort of thing. So that's kind of where we where we fit into these two these two schemes. Swift is designed as being an eventually consistent system. Cinder is designed to provide you strongly consistent block storage for uh, for OpenStack compute. So um, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, Cinder and kind of give you a little more background. Um, kind of talk about how it came to be, what it replaces, um, and and how things work. Um, basically, you know, everything in OpenStack, basically, we talk about this all the time and we think about it. Um, it's basically a pool of resources, right? So it's no longer a, oh, stand up a disk array or stand up a server or stand up whatever this might be. It's, okay, just provide a pool of resources for the end user to actually check out and utilize on their own. Um, so the two important things here are those, these two first items on this list. We're talking about pools of resources, and we're talking about self-service. And that self-service is from an end user's perspective. Um, the thing about Cinder, one of the biggest things, is the whole idea, as again with most of OpenStack, is what we're doing is we're abstracting out all of the hardware and everything else that's behind that. So that pool of resources could be a completely homogenous uh, set of different back-end devices. And it doesn't matter, because what we're doing is we're abstracting all of that and making it easier and simpler for the end user to use and for them to be able to use it and allocate it on their own. Thanks. So this is kind of a, a quick comparison of sort of, you know, the traditional model versus, say, you know, let's call it the OpenStack model in, in using Cinder. Um, so you can see, you know, traditionally it was always you had some storage device that was actually dedicated to a specific server or maybe a specific user. Um, for example, you had a server that was running a MySQL or an Oracle database. You had a certain um, uh, storage device, block storage device with certain characteristics that you would deploy and, and set up and connect to that based on those needs and based on those requirements and what you needed there. Um, the problem with that is what happens is you end up underutilizing capacity, right? Because what happens is you try and plan ahead, you try and build it for what you're going to need in the future and everything, and, and it's pretty monolithic, it's pretty static. Um, you set it all up, and you're never really going to use it to its full potential. Either that, or you go to the other end of the spectrum, and you overutilize it. Um, and that, that's even worse, uh, because then you start to have performance issues, and you have all kinds of things that you run into, and you've got a serious um, heavy investment and heavy effort that you have to do to actually extend that or expand it or actually migrate it all off onto something, you know, maybe a bigger device. So in the old days of, you know, disk arrays and things like that, that's the kind of thing that you had to worry about a lot. Um, the other thing is, is when you start trying to do things like uh, take a single back-end device like a disk array um, in a traditional environment and share it across multiple users and multiple use cases, you start to run into all kinds of things in terms of your planning, um, how to deal with capacity, and most of all, as you get more and more workloads, trying to deal with performance. Um, you know, different applications, different workloads, they're going to have different performance requirements. Um, and the other thing is, you know, some of those requirements or some of those workloads are actually going to take more performance away from your device than others, and they may actually steal performance from other people that need them as well. So that creates a significant problem. Um, and then one of the things I, I love to talk about all the time is the whole, you know, going back to the self-service thing. You know, in the old days, or in the old model, you had to go through and you had to actually do things like go through IT or go through a storage admin or go through a requisition process or whatever it might be. And you had to actually set things up and request or do a purchase order or whatever it was to actually get this storage, have it set up by IT, have it configured, get access, and then, you know, have them set it up for you the way you want. Hopefully everything comes out right so on and so forth. Either that or you just get what they give you, uh, either way. Um, you know, the bottom line is, is in, in that model, everything is very static. 
uh, very monolithic, it's not flexible, um, and, it's, and it's just kind of a pain, right? That's the bottom line. So what we try and do on the OpenStack side of things and in Cinder is we try and make all of this more agile, more flexible, um, and, and also we try and make it scalable. So what you talk about now is a pool of devices. Anybody can use them. Um, we do scheduling uh, inside of Cinder so that you can do things like say, hey, I need a volume that has these characteristics. I need storage with these particular characteristics. And it can go out to your pool of resources and figure out how to allocate a volume or some storage on the correct device so that you actually get what you need. You don't get more than what you need. You don't get less than what you need. So that's kind of the idea. Um, the, ar the architecture and the design um, is, is completely designed for multi-users, uh, multi-user environments and multi-use cases. So like I was talking about before, how you have to worry about, I can't mix this workload with that workload on this device. Uh, so the idea is by using a pool of resources and being able to split that out and select differently, you can eliminate that problem. Um, and then of course, you know, back to the self-service. That's probably the biggest thing, is letting the, the application developers or whoever it might be actually go ahead and make these uh, uh, provisioning requests and everything else on their own. So, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, for those that aren't familiar, kind of how Cinder is made up and what some of the components are. Um, so the idea, you know, most of the, uh, if you look at this and if you're familiar with OpenStack or if you've been to other talks this week and seen some of this stuff, um, you'll notice that this looks really familiar, right? Because we, we kind of all try to follow a, a, a pretty similar design here. Um, so, you know, at the top level, we have an API. Uh, basically, all your requests come in, whether that's through the Python Cinder client, whether it's through the dashboard, Horizon, whatever it might be, or curl requests, whatever. You know, you may write something on your own. So those requests come into the API, and they get put out on the message bus. Um, the default for that is RabbitMQ. And we do that, and we send that out. It gets picked up by the scheduler service. And the scheduler service will then go ahead and send it down as an RPC call to one of the volume services. So this is where I was talking about before. We have a pool of resources now instead of just a static monolithic device. You can have multiple back-end devices um, all set up and configured inside of Cinder. And the scheduler is going to go ahead and figure out where to send that RPC call to get it to the right device. So that's the idea there. So one of the things that I've realized is a lot of people have never actually looked at this, right, from a user's perspective on the dashboard. So um, this is just a, a couple of screen captures here to show you what's available from the, um, from the GUI, from the web interface for OpenStack. Um, so this is pre pretty simple. This is the volumes page. You get just a summary of what volumes exist, um, what their status is, their size, uh, availability zone, so on and so forth. You can see here we have um, what the type is and whether they're attached. Um, so the whole idea of this storage from Cinder's perspective is we're actually creating storage that can be consumed by Nova and by compute instances, and that consumption can either be by attaching them as additional storage, block storage devices, or actually attaching them and using them as the root partition for the boot device on the instance. So go to the next slide. So this is the create process. Um, so you can see it, it's fairly simple. There's not a whole lot to it, right? Uh, we go through and we select a name, we give it a type, or we give it a name and select a type, um, give it a size, and then the option on the volume source, there's two different things you can do here. You can, you can say, I just want a raw volume with no data on it, without any information or anything like that. You can choose to make it an image, um, and what that means, it's going to actually go out to Glance and it's going to download that image and make that volume bootable. So then you can now persistent instances. From Swift. From Swift, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So then you have persistent instances. Um, you know the whole ephemeral versus persistence. Uh, and then one of the other options is um, from volume. So the other thing that you can do is you can actually clone volumes inside of Cinder. So if you have a certain bootable image or you know written down to a volume already, or you have a development environment you have a database, you know, whatever it is, and you want to actually replicate it, you can actually go in and just say, okay, just clone that volume and give me all of that same information again. And then, of course, we also have snapshots. Um, oh, wait, sorry. 
Over here, so these are some of the extra uh, things that you can do with a volume, and this is, this is where things really start to diverge a little bit, right? Because when you look at the old way of doing things, trying to do things like extend a volume, that, that can be a little bit difficult uh, you know, on, a, on an old system. So we can, we can let you do things like extend a volume. We can let you, if it's bootable, you can go ahead and launch it from here. So then you have an instance that's running on that volume inside of Nova. Um, the edit attachments is if you have existing instances already up and running, you can go ahead from here and you can just attach it. Uh, and you give it the mount point and, and attach it as a VDB file or whatever the path might be. Um, and then, of course, we let you do snapshots. Uh, so the snapshots currently are um, tied to the parent volume. Um, you can't delete the volume if you have a snapshot currently, which causes some people some heartache. But um, And you also can't actually use the, volume, the snapshot as if it were a volume. So it's, it's sort of a backup device. Um, the reality is, is what we use it for is a vehicle to get things done more efficiently. So a snapshot is typically very fast. You get a consistent copy, and then you can do things like migrate or clone or duplicate or whatever you might want to do. So, so um, to talk about some use cases, you know, there's, there's, most people are pretty familiar and have a pretty good idea, but um, typically what you're looking at with Cinder is the buzzwords to kind of keep you thinking here are when I need additional persistent capacity for an instance that I've built. So I have an instance in Nova. I've got my ephemeral disk and everything else, but now I want to attach something else and put a whole bunch of data on it, right? So it's just like adding another drive into your instance. Um, and you can do this dynamically on the fly. Add them, take them away, move them, attach them to another instance, whatever you want to do. Um, you can also use it, of course, as I said, for the actual root storage. So you can put your root partition there and actually boot your instance off of it. Use it for file systems, uh, databases, and you know anywhere that you need a raw block device. And of course, like I said, you can then attach multiple Cinder volumes to a single instance. Thanks, John. So if you've got to put a database someplace, you're going to use Cinder or Swift. Cinder. That's right. Good. So just making sure you're paying attention and awake and everything. So Cinder is really great for deploying your volumes and your block devices and making sure that those are dynamically attached to portable and snapshots and all those really kind of cool stuff that you really need directly attached to your compute. So why do we have Swift? If we've got all that kind of stuff, then why do we need Swift? Swift is still vitally important. And the reason is because you need to have application storage that is globally available. You need to be able to directly talk to your end user. You need the applications to be able to directly talk to the storage uh, for that application assets. Uh, you want to be able to have that storage system offload some of those hard, hard problems of storage. The people who are deploying the the IT uh, like the IT group, you know, your your uh, sysadmins who are out there building your storage clusters. Uh, like I said earlier, they're going to want to have a lot of agility to be able to um, to uh, respond very quickly to uh, the needs of their applications, but also have shared storage across different applications. And then finally, and this is one of uh, my little soapboxes that I like to talk about a lot, and one of my reasons that I like OpenStack so much, is that open systems matter. You need to have ownership of your data, and you need to be able to uh, know who and what is touching um, everything, every part of your data, from, your, from the hardware to the storage engine all the way to the client tool chain. And you can only do that with open systems, and that's why we're here with OpenStack. So I wanted to talk about a couple of really cool use cases, um, just three of them just uh, briefly here, uh, thinking about maybe giving you a real world picture of where Swift is being used today. Uh, Pack 12 is something uh, that I talked about a little earlier this morning, uh, and it's really kind of cool. Um, they were using a traditional SAN device for their application storage, and they were running out of space, but they still needed to have highly available storage because they needed to be able to access this all the time. And when they were running out of space, what they did is they decided to archive some of that to tape and then stick it on the shelf, which makes it pretty much not available. And they needed to solve both of these problems, and so they built out their Swift cluster and they migrated their stuff from their, um, their, uh, their archives and their SAN to their Swift cluster. And what that gives them is a lot of new power and flexibility in what they can do. So when the Pac-12 is doing video recording of 800 sporting events a year, then they can actually respond very quickly to that and uh, 
put, uh, know that their storage is available, but they can even take that old stuff and introduce new revenue models and things like that because it's now available instead of being gathering dust on a shelf someplace. So if you want to go see some old football game or something like that, then maybe it's possible now with available storage that you can just ask and they don't have to worry about getting a tape robot to plug it in the right place and all this kind of stuff. That's not a scalable model, but something that already is storing it in highly available storage does allow you to do that. The next use case I want to uh, mention very briefly is uh, something I just heard about this week. Uh, which was really kind of cool. And I, I've mentioned it to a few of you I know already this week. Um, so the, when the Malaysia airline flight went down, uh, people were scouring the Indian Ocean for the plane. And one of the things they were trying to do is figure out, well, if a plane crashed, then where would the debris be? Well, there's this site that's hosted in Australia and it's called adrift.org.au. And they were discovered, basically, by a newspaper to that the, the cool thing is you can go click on any point in the ocean, and it just shows you what the dispersion pattern is for the next 10 years. Really kind of a cool thing. It's really fun to play with. But apparently, a newspaper discovered it, and then they got overwhelmed by request. And they decided they had a couple of options. One, they could continue to build out their, their web server and just add more Nginx nodes or something like that. And that's, that's kind of a traditional, fine way to do things. But you know, it has extra operational cost, and it's just you know, a little more complex to build that system out. It turns out that their data was already stored in Swift. And so what they were able to do is, instead of having to build out their web servers, just point the browsers directly at Swift. And it automatically worked. And boom, their scaling problems were gone. And this is a really great story. And I was, uh, when I first heard about it, I said some stuff on Twitter about it. And I got a response from one of the guys who ran it. And he was saying that you know, Swift has been a great way to help make our site scalable. And so it was just really great affirmation. I love hearing that kind of uh, story. And I think it's something that just about all of us can really make use of on almost an everyday basis. The last, um, last use case I want to show is kind of a, a little different one, moving from the, the uh, the video streaming uh, and, and archi active archiving uh, sort of use case, looking at something like web content. And then this one from Fred Hertz uh, Cancer Research. They were speaking earlier today. Um, they're in cancer and AIDS research. And as part of that, they have to do lots of like gene sequencing and you know, store massive, massive data sets. And they need to be able to share that internally but they need to be able to have something that they own that is, uh, is going to last a long time, but it gives them pretty relatively cheap storage um, across that much data. And they were able to build out uh, a Swift cluster and get really, really low price performance uh, 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 price uh, points uh, for that. Uh, or some numbers earlier uh, this week. There's like less than two cents a gig for, for, their, uh, for their use case um, on their large scale storage, which is really impressive. So how does Swift work? Well, I wanted to point out something very important. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I'll get to the important part in just a second. So uh, the first part, the first important part, is let's talk about the API. Um, all of the services in OpenStack use a REST-based API. And so that's a commonality uh, between all of our stuff. And in fact, this week we're here talking, and one of the, one of the conversations earlier, this, earlier today was how do we make sure we, uh, we come together as a project and make um, really good unified decisions on that. This is what a uh, URI looks like for Swift. You have an account, a container, an object. And this is really just where you place your data um, throughout the system. An account keeps a list of containers. A container keeps a list of objects. And then the objects are where you actually store your data. So um, let's say I have an account on a Swift cluster. And I create my, um, I to create my images folder. And then I want to upload cat.jpg because the internet is for cat pictures. So if I upload account uh, cat.jpg, then is that going to be list, is that stored as an account, a container, or an object? The object. The object, that's right. So this is where your data actually is. And if you're storing you know, cancer gene uh, sequence, whatever, that's going to be some object someplace. This is what it looks like just to add a new object and to get an object back. Simple HTTP verbs and response code. So it's very easy to integrate into existing um, applications. It's, it speaks the native language of the web, so it works very, very well with existing web technologies like caching and CDN and, and uh, browsers and things like that. 
And this is the important point that I really wanted to drive home, and I think it's the, the, one of the biggest differences in something like Swift and something like Cinder. Swift implements an object storage engine. Swift is responsible for making sure your data is effectively stored across a large set of hard drives and does that and keeps them securely stored, durably stored, and highly available. Swift is not a provisioning system for other object storage systems. You do not ask Swift to give you a pool of object storage with vendor object storage system X. That's not the way Swift works. Swift's purpose is to abstract away the storage volumes away from the application in such that you have your data and it is very uh, durably stored, highly available. This is the design of Swift. This is how we implemented this object storage uh, system. The client talks to what's called a proxy server. The proxy server implements most of the API and then passes that on to a uh, passes request onto the storage server. The storage servers are responsible for abstracting away those storage volumes. So in this case, um, if a client, let's say a web browser, were trying to talk to a Swift cluster, does the web browser ever directly touch a hard drive? Yes or no? No, it does not. Because the purpose of Swift is to abstract away those, those hard drives, so it never has to worry about it. This way, hard drives can come and go um, intentionally or, un, or not, and the s system still remains available. And so the other purpose of the proxy server is to make sure that the, uh, the storage nodes are, the responses there are uh, correlated and the client gets the right response code back. So when we're writing out data, make sure it's durably persisted in uh, several locations, and then you can get the information back. And the client knows as soon as it gets a response code uh, that says this has been successfully written, it is available for you to use. It's not that it's going to write it later. That's not what eventual consistency means within Swift. What it means is it's going to be written right now. Um, it just means that when you have something that is, um, when you have some failures, um, Swift will recover from that in the background. And so, there is no single point of failure in this, uh, in this design. There's no centralized message queue. There's no centralized database. There's no centralized uh, index of metadata, of you know, location placement, or anything like that. So it's a fully distributed system that really just continues to get better the bigger you add it out. And the last point I want to make about Swift here, I think it's the last point, is that it's optimized for massive concurrency across the entire data set. So in the, in the example of the adrift.org site, it is designed so that not one request is going to be you know, as fast as possible, but it means that it can handle all of those requests pouring into it from all around the world. That's what Swift is really good at. Another use case I really like to talk about sometimes, and I mentioned it here at previous summits, is the fact that Wikipedia is using images um, stored in their own Swift cluster. Because you can think about it, they need something that's going to be that massive concurrency across all of their articles. So I want to talk a little bit briefly about the data placement here um, within Swift and how we do this. Because um, as an implementation of the object storage system, that's kind of an important piece to understand. So this is a little more technical info. Um, but we use something that is called uh, consistent hashing. This is a, um, a, it sounds like it's a complicated topic, but it is a lot that goes into it. But we're all really familiar with it. Um, imagine it's a set of encyclopedias. You, have, uh, you know how to look up something in an encyclopedia. You find uh, what letter does it start with. Then you go to that volume of the encyclopedia. And that's how it works. That's just a basic, simple hashing algorithm. If you want to get a little more complicated, then you can use what's called a hash function that evenly places things um, throughout this uh, a single, uh, what's called a key space. And so you hash a value, and you're given an output. And that output is just some really big number. Now, the way that uh, consistent hashing works is we call it a, a ring, because if you go to the biggest number you could possibly get and add one, well, then you just loop back around to the end, uh, to the beginning. So basic consistent hashing means that you hash something, and it shows you some point on this ring. And for example, you can walk clockwise, clockwise around the ring, find where that first node was, that first storage node, and then that is now responsible for uh, dealing with that storage. We've optimized this a little bit in, inside of Swift to have a little bit better data placement, because you want, some, you want something that's a little um, 
you want something that's uh, a little more reliable and robust against uh, failure. You don't want all of the copies of your, uh, uh, of your data to be stored on the same hard drive. You need to be able to make sure that it is uh, stored across different uh, failure domains, drives, servers, racks of servers, even entire DCs. And so this is uh, very important uh, to understand so that when you are going to place um, a piece of data, let's say it's going it's to, uh, Swift is going to store multiple copies of that data in the system. And it chooses where to do that based on you know, this principle that we call as unique as possible. What that means is that if you have more uh, than one server, we're going to make sure that it's stored across hard drives on those different servers. In fact, we're going to make sure it's not even stored on the same hard drive. Then it's not going to be stored across different, uh, the, same, the same server if you have more than one server. In, in this example here, if you have just two racks, it's going to make sure it uses both of them. And in, if you're just in one region, it's going to, um, naturally everything's going to be there. But if it will use as much as you have available. In this way, uh, it means that you can lose, for example, an entire rack or even an entire data center and still have available uh, durable data. And this is something that I wanted to highlight a little bit, especially in relation to talking about uh, Cinder and the other object storage and uh, at, at the, I'm sorry, the other storage systems inside of Swift. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> OpenStack has several different pieces and components, and some of them are uh, storage, and there's other ones as well. And the, so it's very important to talk about the extensibility points within uh, within Swift. So as John was talking about and hinted at, that Cinder is this provisioning layer for block storage that may call out to a particular storage implementation, a storage driver. And that's their, that's their primary way of being extensible, is you're able to add in different implementations of block, uh, of block storage um, that you can then attach to volumes uh, to your virtual machines. Well, Swift has a couple of important places to, uh, to implement extensibility. And two of them that I really want to talk about um, are the, uh, the middleware and the, ex and the volume extension. And uh, remember, this is the design we had about Swift. So let's, let's break this in two. So if you take the front part, the, you know, the communication between the client and the proxy server, there may be some API extensions you want to add into that. And so we can support middleware that will allow you to write your own custom code that you can run on, on the proxy server that, for example, could implement something like searching or transcoding a video or caching or something like that. And the other end, and this is where it gets um, uh, really interesting, I think. We've had a lot of active development uh, lately to improve this. Uh, but on the back end, how does Swift actually talk to these hard drives? How does it talk to a storage volume? And we've seen a lot of in, uh, improvements uh, in the flexibility of the system within Swift. And today, I can think of at least four places where we have different volume implementations for Swift. For example, we've got the default that we use, which is just a local uh, POSIX file system. Uh, we recommend XFS, but you can use anything just about. Um, we also have uh, people out there, the Red Hat specifically has contributed to ensuring that Swift can run on top of cluster volumes. We know that the Zero VM team uh, has been exploring the possibilities or the, the, the exciting opportunities around uh, keeping compute and storage tied together. And they've uh, implemented their own uh, Zero VM uh, volume abstraction that allows them to uh, execute code securely right next to the data. And then uh, the fourth one is the... Oh, you could, well, you could think about, uh, for example, um, some other abstractions that may include Let's do encryption, or let's do compression, or something like that. So as it's passed down onto the storage volume, you could actually compress it and get a little more efficient storage. You can encrypt it for operational or, or procedural uh, reasons. So that basically sums up the entire uh, thing of what I wanted to talk about, and basically say that uh, Cinder and Swift both have very important use cases within OpenStack, work well together as far as the volume snapshotting, the backups, the loading from images through Glance, and things like that. And I hope that that helps you under better understand where the two projects fit and why you would use one over the other. And to add to that, one of the things that um, you know hopefully makes sense now is you actually want both Swift and Cinder um, for the different use cases. Um, and one of the things that I saved to the end for the better together part um, is the fact that one of the great things about Cinder and Swift and using the two of them is you can actually do backups of your volumes in Cinder to a Swift object store, which is an extremely great target for that. So 
Um, does anybody have any questions? We can hear over the air conditioner. To, to get over the air. Although I'm glad it came on. <laughs> yes, I, I, I probably couldn't even hear you in the front row. Can you go to the microphone, please? Um, with Cinder, can you over provision, or, or are the volumes out fully allocated when you when they're created? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question, and it depends on what backend driver you use. Um, so the reference implementation for Cinder right now uses LVM. Uh, it has a built-in LVM driver. With the base uh, default LVM driver right now today, you cannot over provision. However, um, you can actually configure the thin provisioned LVM driver, and then of course, as the name would imply, <laughs> there you go over here? Yeah, uh, so my question was about Swift. Um, I saw that uh, you tried to geographically disperse files. So let's say you're starting small and you have one geographical location, say West, um, and then you've got a, a healthy Swift installation. Can you bring up another uh, zone or geographical location and then basically bring everything that's over here in the background? Over yes. To the new new thing. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. That is one of the design characteristics of Swift that we've been uh, very keen on making sure it stays in the forefront with every piece of code that is contributed. Is that we've got you've got to be able to manage uh, capacity changes on an existing cluster. Um, also, that includes you know we've got to be able to reboot with no no client downtime or up upgrade and things like that. Um, so yes, in that sense, it is possible to weight each particular um, region or zone. Uh, and then change that weight gradually, and it, it will uh, automatically rebalance things um, in a smooth way that won't overwhelm your network. This is a Cinder question. Can you take uh, recurring incremental snapshots in Cinder? So you're going to have to be more specific with your definition. <laughs> I have a feeling I know where you're going, but. Well, I mean, could you make the, the snapshot just take incremental changes since the last time you took a snapshot? Yeah. So with the reference driver LVM, it's just using LVM snapshots, and so they are. So you're basically just creating a cal file and just doing that. Um, so the thing about Cinder that's kind of interesting and that's significantly different about Swift, the the focus on Cinder is abstracting out block storage devices on the back end, right? So. Um, depending on which abstraction you choose to use and what device you implement on the back end, that's why the question like, does it do over provisioning? You know, does it do, it, the question is always maybe, <laughs> and it depends. But the reference implementation in, in both of these cases, you can do that, yes. Thank you. Well, I don't see anybody else at the microphone, but I think John and I will probably be up here in the front just for a couple minutes. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and have a great week. Thank you, everyone.